Greetings, all you tech lovers out there, to another episode of Stuart's Random Tech and Media. In this episode, we have a blast from the past. Well, at least my past, anyhow. But I find some of the older tech a little more common, and maybe not as frustrating as the day to day struggles with modern technology. At least that's what I like to tell myself. What I have here today is one of my old retro machines from the late 90s and early 2000s that I'm rebuilding and plan to use it as a permanent retro DOS machine. Stick around to see what kind of trouble I can get into. As with anything old, it usually means it has experience with it. And in the case of this DOS machine, it has taken a bit of a beating. The story of this PC starts when I bought it from a flea market back in the early 2000s as a temporary solution as I had just changed cities and I needed a computer. Eventually this machine ended up on the shelf and even was a web server for a number of years in the 2000s. I also do enjoy hearing from the viewers so ask your questions or tell me a little bit about your retro activities in the comments. I had completely forgotten that this machine had even existed as it sat in my grandmother's basement for roughly 15 years. That is until I discovered it after the house was being sold. Unfortunately the machine, well let's just say became the permanent home of some little gray colored creatures that have an appetite for cheese and peanut butter. Yes, this is exactly how I found the machine, littered with little bits of green plastic and this thing was disgustingly dirty on the inside. However, I did have hope that I would be able to bring it back to life, eventually that is, and that eventually was another year or so. And now I finally have the opportunity to resurrect it. And that day is today. So I did an initial vacuum of the machine when I first found it, which I don't actually have the footage of. So it's not actually quite as disgusting as you might imagine. Also the machine didn't have the original parts when I first bought it. But the parts it has now are surprisingly suitable for the machine I intend to restore. Inside this beast, we have an AMD K6233 MHz processor or CPU or the 3.2 volt variety, an Asus VX97 motherboard with an award bias from 1995, 64 megabytes of SD RAM, of the non-EDO type or EDO memory type, a Mitsumi 4 times CD-ROM drive, a 2 gigabyte Maxter IDE hard disk that actually was working, 512 megabytes of static cache, and an S3 Trio 64V Plus version which is a non-3D accelerated graphics adapter with 2 megabytes of RAM. So it did have some Windows acceleration, I believe. It also has a Sound Blaster 16, the Vibra type, I, I assume. And of course, it has a working CMOS battery, which is amazing in itself. The first and most obvious thing that I needed to do was to strip down all the unneeded components to do a proper power supply test. So I pulled the case apart, which is rather unique in its design, in that it has two side panels and a top panel that are separate from each other. Now unlike other cases at the time, they usually had one piece of rolled steel that would surround the case. I started pulling cables off the motherboard and add-ons. I did a quick cleaning to get rid of some surface dust with my handy powered duster. And these things are absolutely great. 
No, really, they are. <laughs> All I needed was a vacuum cleaner, and then I could suck up the dust that was coming out and floating around in the air. I then removed the power supply from the case, which is still the original power supply, and even more remarkable is that this thing has modular connectors on it. Three of them to be exact. Although I'm not sure that this really helps in this situation, as in older builds you generally needed all the cables anyways. After doing an initial inspection and checking some of the cables, I plugged her in. And well, let's see if we can get some purple smoke. Well, no, there was no purple smoke yet. But I did notice one thing, and it's a good thing I didn't turn it on, because on one of the Molex connectors, one of the wires had been eaten through by those little, little critters that were living inside the case. And this would have likely caused a short and some sparks, to say the least. As a sort of temporary solution, I wrapped some electrical tape around it. Eventually, I will have to solder it and get some shrink wrap to do a proper job, but not today. After doing some more inspection, I pulled out my phone and thought it might be in my best interest to also check the power switch connector to make sure there is no damage there. I figured since I was doing some repair anyways, I would go get my power supply tester, even though it is meant for ATX power supplies. Yes, I did struggle a bit to get the connectors in. I must have been having a slow day. Everything seems to check out, at least on that rail, as it did light up green, indicating that there was no issues. I made sure I had my flame retardant on standby as well, or maybe I was the flame retardant for starting this project. I then put in the video card, and this is where the real test begins. I pray that this thing wasn't going to smoke or light up on fire. So let her rip. Well, uh, yeah, not exactly what I was expecting. So we got one long beep, three short beeps for my postcode. But it did continue, so that's a good sign. No smoke, no pops, no nothing funny going on thus far. So yeah, I think we got liftoff. Bias beep. However, I did forget to plug in the monitor cable, so I'm going to have to take care of that, obviously. After doing a bit more fiddling and turning the case around so I could plug in the BJ cable to the graphics card, let's see if anything comes on the screen now. The suspense is killing me. Well, no, not really, but... There still wasn't anything on the screen, but I did wait. And maybe if I zoom in, it will coax it to work. What do you think, huh? Oh, well. No, it was still wasn't turning on. But, yeah, I was kind of dumb in this situation. I had it set to digital, not analog. And I was plugging in the VJ cable, so. And just like Frankenstein. Oh, it's alive. It's alive. It's alive. I did a reboot. Because there was no system disk, and checking over the configuration, it all sort of looked good. Well, except for one thing. Maybe you noticed this on the system configuration screen. That's right, it is 150 megahertz, not 233. I'm going to deal with that later. However, I really wanted to pull that power supply apart and do a cleaning inside and check the capacitors in case there was any leaking or bulging. After fighting with the cover for a while, I managed to get it off. Oh, wow. Look at that glorious 20-year-old dust in there. I can guarantee you that Duke wouldn't be biting any of this dust. And out comes the vacuum and the duster. As I make a huge mess, let's not forget the fan. That is the important part here. Now that's a little better. The power supply certainly got improvement, but I'm not 100% happy. 
yet. So I need to whip out the contact cleaner. After spraying it down and a whole lot of stink, I forgot to open the window. The power supply is in a much more acceptable condition. But just one final blast with the duster to remove any excess liquid and grime. Well, maybe not the last because I noticed that there was still some grime between the circuit board and the case of the power supply. Didn't want any shorts happening here. I got in there a bit and I think I am satisfied now and put the power supply back together correctly. Now it's on to the rest of the disassembly and cleaning. But first, let's take a quick peek at the CPU heatsink and the CPU. It turns out that the thermal paste was still soft. Not sure what I used back then, but it was still in half decent shape. I decided to wipe it off anyways and put a bit less on and clean up the heatsink. What really needed to happen at this point was to tear the whole computer down to the bare case and give it a thorough cleaning. Yep, that's right. I got to get into all the tight areas and to make sure there's no more remnants of the furry little habitants left behind. The CD-ROM drive was from an era long past, which was a four times Matsumi. Apparently I paid $9.99 for it in the 2000s from a thrift shop or a used computer store. This at the time was quite slow because they were 52 speed CD-ROMs already out and DVD drives were already out as well. I did have to take a quick trip to the toolbox and to get a pipe wrench so I could bend back that fan holder and speaker mount at the front inside of the case. Maybe sometime down the road I'll do a proper job of straightening it out but this will have to suffice for now. The front bezel will also have to come off and boy oh boy was the front bezel dirty. I went straight to the sink with it for a good cleaning and wipe down. You may also notice that the bezel has some homemade drill marks in it. I suppose at the time I had a larger fan in there and the smaller holes were restricting the airflow. Let's be honest here, this is case modification 101. Make bigger speed holes now. And then on to the hard drive and floppy cage. Gotta pull these bad boys out of course. The first being what looks to be a 1.44 megabyte Panasonic floppy and then the Maxter hard drive. I did run into a problem though. The three and a half inch cage was barely doing its job because the hard disk and floppy were actually touching each other and it made it very difficult to have the screws lined up to the threads and not only that, I struggled for a good while trying to get it back through the opening. So I decided to swap the floppy and hard disk positions instead to try to make the situation better. And I was trying for a very, very long time and it was getting a little annoying to tell you the truth to try to squeeze them together and nothing I did was actually working to fix the situation. Even though adjusting the screw positions back and forth and up and down to whatever I could get it to sit at, it just wasn't happening. I thought I had outsmarted the case and managed to finally squish it all together and started to reassemble the components and power supply. Back in went to connectors, the motherboard, the various COM ports, and even a USB breakout bracket I found. All took longer than I had anticipated. A few minutes later and a few searches later, I found the motherboard manual. I also had a decision to make regarding the cooling situation. I didn't want this thing to be too loud, but I also wanted it to have good cooling in case I want to overclock it down the road. 
So I found this older Cooler Master heatsink and cooler with a d dedicated control knob on it. But alas, it wasn't meant to be as it was for a different socket type. I decided to go with a smaller fan instead that wasn't really meant for this heatsink, but it was close enough and I found four screws that would actually work. I also did a quick test of the fan to make sure it was working well. Please don't do this at home, kids. I wouldn't want you clipping your fingers off. And remember, I am a seasoned expert at breaking things and hurting myself. And of course, there's the thermal paste. I didn't have much left, so I made do. It won't make much difference anyways on this old machine, as even the cooler and heat sink on this is a bit overkill. I suppose I will have to pixelate this area as it might get a little bit too sensitive for some viewers out there. And then back to the web, pull up the manual for the motherboard to check out the number of jumpers. And I wanted to find out I had to change the voltages, the frequency and the front side bus speed. On my first attempt, I couldn't see how the jumpers were labeled, so I ended up adjusting the voltage ID instead, which I thought was the frequency. And then I moved on to what I thought was the clock speed, but then again, I thought that was also the front side's bus speed. I connected a few more cables, put in the graphics adapter and turned it on, and it did power on, and it was at the correct frequency, but I didn't realize it at the time. Even though the system was booting, it wasn't going to be very stable. I bet you can guess why. Put your thoughts in the comments. I wanted to see if the hard disk was going to boot as well and test the floppy. So I plugged it all in, got the connector sorted out, making sure red was to pin one on the motherboard. And also the cable select was on the right side of the connector. For good measure, I thought I would try one of these rounded off IDE cables for the hard disk. CD-ROM drive went back in as well, and the remaining connectors for the motherboard such as the reset, the hard drive, LED, and speaker. And let's not forget the sound card with the CD-ROM header, specifically the Sound Blaster 16 CT2980 which is what I like to call a plug and pray model because you never know if it's going to actually detect things correctly. I also managed to have the right adapters available for my keyboard as you can see. So yeah, let's dust up the keyboard anyways and make a bigger mess. Anyhow, the moment of truth is here with everything hooked back up and let's turn it on. It turned on fine, and it sort of found the master drive, but this is where the real trouble started to begin. The drive wasn't finishing the detection phase. And after reboot, it wasn't even showing up on the BIOS boot screen at all. Well, what gives here? So I went back to the drawing board and played with the jumpers a bit more. I am not sure if I had fixed the jumpers at this point, but I did eventually find the mistake I made regarding the voltage, which had been set to 2.8 rather than the required 3.2 volts. There were actually two versions of this chip if I am correct in my memory. I couldn't get into the bias and it was still stuck at detecting the drive. And not only that, it wasn't detecting the CD-ROM drive either. That is until I fiddled around a bit and it booted off the CD-ROM drive into an old free BSD version. I thought perhaps the keyboard was defective. So I tried a keyboard without any adapters and went on a bit of a side adventure with that. I did get into the bias and made a bunch of changes, but as well, you can see, uh, yeah, 
I couldn't get out or save my changes. The Y key wasn't working. Ah, oh, for heaven's sakes. Oh well, let's start booting a version 4 of FreeBSD instead. Which actually turned out to be Monowall once it fully booted. The precursor to PFSense or the fork. Or PFSense would have been the fork to Monowall. And eventually when I picked up the machine, I had Windows 2000 on it. I did a third keyboard swap with a PS2 and then I was finally able to do things in the BIOS and actually save the changes. But will it work? And will it detect the hard drive? Sadly, no. And as a side note, it is rather noisy even for this era of hard disks. Anyway, I got distracted again and let's see if the floppy drive at least works. I had some old floppies laying around, a sound blaster, a random HD diagnostics disc, and a fix it floppy, which after finally booting from turned out to be a free BSD fix it floppy. I also tried the diagnostics disc, but it must have been Windows 2K or NT 4 or 3.5 or something in that regard because it was complaining about NT loader. It might even mean XP, I don't know. Since I'm in the mood for testing things, I popped in a random Windows 98 repair disk that was missing files. But hey, I was able to boot and do some stuff at least at the command prompt. Weren't those the great old days? I still wasn't getting the hard drive though. So it was time to start adjusting the jumpers on the CD-ROM and the hard drive to ensure they were configured as master and slave. Me being the master, of course. And after trying to boot, I realized that this hard drive was dead or had some other problem, namely because it would hang. So I brought in a second hard drive, which was one of my favorite back in the day, being the Quantum Fireball one of the fastest to exist at the time. The joke being that sometimes these things were so fast that they would end up catching on fire. Well, maybe not literally, but they would end up destroying themselves on a frequent occasion. I tried this drive and it wouldn't boot either. I played around with it for a while attempting to get it to work. I gave up on that idea and then tried another Maxter drive that didn't detect either. And I was going around in circles for quite a while. I went back to the first drive. And now it was able to be seen in the bias, even if it had the incorrect drive parameters. But this thing still would not boot. And then going to yet another drive, having the same issue. I spent far more time on this whole drive issue than I was expecting. I even tried playing around with Max Blast, a hard drive provisioning and diagnostics utility. And I put a SATA controller into the computer as well, because I figured it could be useful for moving data between the external SATA drive and an internal one, and even the DVD. I then also tried an older version of the Ultimate Boot CD, and then a Linux Care Boot CD, and it was all very futile to get the hard disk mounted. And I was just spinning my wheels at this point, and not the circular platter kind found in the disks themselves. There are two things I do have to admit though at this whole process, which was just carelessness on my part. It actually happened off camera. The first being the original drive probably would have worked, and I think I even had it detected initially. But while I was installing it into the cage, I only had one screw in it. And while I was reinstalling the cage into the case for testing, it ended up dropping vertically into the case with a rather good jolt. I believe this jolt destroyed the drive or at least smashed the heads into the platter. The second drive I installed into the cage was probably also working 
The problem with the 3.5 inch cage is that the flopping hard discs were too close to each other, as I had mentioned. And I'm almost certain I smelt something funny while turning it on. And I'm almost positive I shored the main PCB, bricking yet another drive. So yes, unfortunately, two older hard disks were harmed in the making of this video. I was having a real rough day with hard disks, that's for sure. This whole process was a real head scratcher for me, that's for sure. I had all but given up and ended up using a SATA hard disk instead, as it was detecting perfectly from the get-go. I may go back to IDE when I have a bit more time to figure things out. I also adjusted a jumper on the hard drive so that wouldn't go past 32 gigabytes. What I did do later down the road was actually update the BIOS so that it would see the whole amount. I also installed a five and a quarter inch drive that I had from my original 386DX40 machine, which was my first IBM based PC I ever owned. I was more than surprised to find that the drive worked without issue as seen here, although I should probably give it a good clean out. I did go on yet another little side adventure though, because that pesky Y key on the AT 5 pin keyboard was really bothering me. So I pulled it apart and cleaned up the contacts and that seemed to do the trick. However, the rubber membrane isn't perfect. Occasionally, I still have to push the key sideways to get it to sit in the rubber membrane correctly. I also played around with the mouse for a good while. I tried two USB mice in FreeDOS and after spending several hours and many reboots on FreeDOS and working with the various USB drivers, I just gave up. The two issues I had were that one USB mouse wouldn't detect under DOS consistently because of IRQ conflicts. And the second was that when I did get the mouse working in a DOS program, it was horribly slow and laggy. After doing some research on the web, I found that FreeDOS 1.3 has some kernel issues with interrupt timings and the USB devices. So in the end, I tried with a Windows 98 boot disk and it worked worked perfectly out of the gate. However, one side effect of going with regular DOS was that loading drivers was going to be taking up a lot of low or conventional memory. So the, for the time being, I abandoned the USB mouse, which was working, for a serial mouse that I had bought secondhand. And depending on what I boot, I have about 615k or so free of lower memory which is more than enough for 99% of the games and programs out there. I may down the road add Smart Drive to the mix from the free DOS binaries as well, but to tell you the truth, I don't even think I need to because the SATA drive in this machine is so much more faster than the IDE was back in the day. There was one quirk, however, with the SATA drive though. Supposedly you can get a, even more consistent speed out of it using the SATA controller in IDE mode instead. It does require flashing the BIOS on it and I just wasn't in the mood for that so I left it as is. The card I actually had laying around was a common silicon image PCI device from the mid 2000s or so. But even so, it still seemed much faster than the IDE drive did at the time so I'm going to leave it for the time being. Onward and upward, I say, or backward and downward in this case. I was a bit strapped for time, did a quick BIOS patch to support larger hard disks, did some partitioning, and found myself a copy of Windows 98 SE, and did a full install of it. I also found the unofficial Service Pack 2 on a CD I had made years ago and installed and then customized the io.sys, the autoexec.bat, and config sys to boot straight to DOS with CD-ROM and basic mouse support, so that I could get some DOS games running on it. 
I believe I took the CD-ROM driver from FreeDOS instead of using the standard one that came with Windows 98. I got it all working just in time for our monthly Retro Computer Club and I had a few games installed such as Doom, Warcraft 1, uh, and some role-playing games. I was also thinking of naming my Retro PC and this is where I need your help. What should I call this thing? So some of the names I have come up with so far are Mr. Doss, St. Isidore, who happens to be the t patron saint of technology, Patches, as in mixed technology, Frankie, maybe it's a Frankenstein computer, or something else. So if you have some ideas, put them in the comments. I'll put mine in the comments, or just like the comment that you think is the best pick. And that is going to do it for this video. I will dive more into this computer in a future video. I do plan to do some more cosmetic upgrades to the computer and do more of an exploration of DOS and Windows 98 SE. I have a number of floppy disks and CDs I want to reload, including Need for Speed SE for DOS and some other treasures that will be kept a secret for now. So anyhow, take care everyone and thanks for watching. Don't forget to subscribe, like or comment at the end of this video. I do appreciate all of the viewers that are listening or watching this. And I do hope you stick around for any future videos.